Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany. This is lecture 13 where we're going to talk about what are the major events in the history of life. So this lecture we're going to talk a little bit about the origin of life um, very briefly, the oldest fossil evidence we have of life, and then basically the pattern of going from single-celled organisms to multicellular organisms which we'll touch upon again uh, in later lectures. We'll also talk a little bit at the end about the major extinction events that happen throughout the Phanerozoic and give you sort of a big picture view of the history of life on our planet. The origin of life occurred about 3.5 billion years ago or about 3,500 million years ago. Today this has been extended about 3,800 million years ago or 3.8 billion years ago. Uh, based on some isotopic uh, signatures that indicate that life uh, was around very early. In fact, this is only about one billion years um, after the formation of the planet. Um, the origin of life starts to, um, we start to see evidence of life very early on in the history of the planet. Basically, once the planet cooled down enough to support oceans, we start to see the beginnings of life. And this occurred very early in the history of the planet. So this means that life on our planet has been around for a very long time. And throughout this long time, most of it has been single-celled organisms. It's only been recently, within the last about 600 million years, that we have multicellular life. So life has a very long history of being single-celled organisms. And we'll talk a little bit about that in this lecture. Now, the origin of life as a topic needs to start with the Stanley Miller experiment. So Stanley Miller was a graduate student working with Harold Urey. Now, Harold Urey is quite famous for his geochemical uh, research that he did. He also won a Nobel Prize in chemistry. And Stanley Miller was a student at the University of Chicago and was interested in ways in which you could um, perhaps um, abiotically, that means without life, create the ingredients for life. And he did a very simple experiment. Basically he took uh, what was then known as probably the what the atmosphere was like on an early planet. This means no oxygen um, because most of the oxygen came from life later on. But an atmosphere composed of, of hydrogen, water, methane, ammonia, and carbon monoxide and you put that into a flask and then he thought well I gotta create an ocean so he created an ocean and put that under a heat source so it caused evaporation so he could cycle water through this and then he added a little bit of energy he added a electrical spark that was in the atmosphere this would be simulating lightning and he basically ran this in fact in the 1950s, 1960s, even in the 70s and 80s, there were a lot of these sort of experiments where people just would take all the ingredients that you'd find, um, all these chemical things, throw them into a beaker and just see what happens. But Stanley Miller was able to show that you actually, in the end, once you start looking at the water that results from this, you start to get kind of complicated carbon molecules. These are the amino acids. Now, amino acids have also been found in meteorites as well. But this was a good experiment that you could actually create the building blocks of DNA simply by a very simple experiment. And so there are many amino acids that were probably available very early on uh, once the oceans began to form in the Earth. Now, the next step was to make those amino acids and build them up into larger polymers and in particular RNA. Now RNA, remember, codes for proteins. Um, and it's basically a messenger between the DNA and the, through the cell membrane, through the nucleus, and then it codes for proteins and amino acids that are used by the cell. So RNA um, is a very important component. It's kind of a stepping stone in terms of getting to DNA. And so the synthesis of RNA is a little bit more complicated. And in the 1990s, J.D. Sullivanders and a few other um, researchers in England were able to show that you can actually create long polymer chains uh, that resemble RNA 
um, by simply taking those amino acids, mixing them in different combinations, and then having them evaporate, so evaporating out the water. This seemed to support the idea that the origin of life may have been in a shallow marine sort of setting where we start getting the origin of life. Now this presents an idea of what's called the RNA world, a world in which is actually RNA that's replicating and forms life from a chemical sort of component. And there, unfortunately, there isn't a very strong evidence in the fossil record of an RNA world because an RNA world is just a bunch of polymers of carbon, and these unfortunately don't fossilize. So this is a hypothesis that's been for, put forth. And one of the real interesting caveats is this is can you have life without necessarily a cell? It's simply RNA chains. And that's something that uh, many chemists have been working on trying to uh, make a synthesized or RNA an RNA world in a beaker. The next real breakthrough has happened in the last couple years, and that's the work of Greg Venter's um, synthetic life. Now, synthetic life is basically life that's synthetic, as it says. It's manufactured, and it's basically manufactured DNA. So one of the things that um, Greg Venter's group has done is basically take DNA and be able to insert that DNA into cells, into bacterial cells. And then those cells themselves start to replicate, and they replicate the synthesized DNA. They put in the code of the DNA certain markers, so then when they go back and sequence the DNA of those bacteria, they are able to recognize that they're actually synthetic and not natural DNA. Now, this is not quite creating life by itself because you require life as one of the ingredients. One of the big challenges has been a cellular membrane, or how to create a cellular membrane. Many bacteria have a very complicated membrane that's been developed to combat viruses that infect bacteria. And so getting DNA to replicate itself is a bit like humans taking on the role of a virus. And viruses are sort of self-replicating um, code that is on the kind of cusp of whether it's life or not. And so we're getting to the point where we can actually synthesize a viral um, that can basically infect DNA and re or infect bacteria with its DNA and replicate itself. So we're getting pretty close. The big kicker, though, is how to create a cellular membrane to enclose like an RNA or DNA uh, chain or polymer inside of the um, inside this early life and have it replicate. So we're getting very, very close. In fact, um, we're getting very close to being able to synthesize life um, in a natural setting um, as we start to play around a lot more with DNA and sort of tweak out some of the complexity of this. So when we talk about the origin of life, we're talking about organisms that are prokaryotic organisms. Prokaryotic organisms include bacteria, and they're now placed into two kingdoms, the archaea bacteria, or the archaea, and the U bacteria, which include cyanobacteria. These are the blue-green algaes, and I'll talk a little bit about them. The archaea bacteria, or archaea, are sort of thermophile bacteria that's been found in hot, hot um, sulfur springs. They've been found deep in the earth. They're a very primordial type of group of bacteria, and as such, they're often placed in their own kingdom. The other type, the eubacteria, includes many organisms that live within us, like E. coli, and many other types of bacteria, like cyanobacteria, the blue-green algaes, that are very common. Eubacteria is found ubiquitously throughout the planet. They're very common. In fact, you probably have millions and trillions of eubacteria living on you. They're very simple cells that have a simple membrane. And the DNA sits around in the, in the inside of the cell without a nucleus. So there's no nucleus, there's no membrane about, around it. And they have you know, few or no sort of organelles. And so as such, they're very small, but very complicated little creatures. Their DNA is in rings rather than in chromosomes. Now, I mentioned that prokaryotics are very small organisms, super teeny. This is a picture here of um, a paramecium and um, some eukaryotic um, microorganisms, and there is E. coli for a scale, super teeny. So these are like really teeny, teeny types of life, the tiniest life. 
there's no nucleus, and the DNA and the RNA actually hang out inside the cell, not in a nucleus, in what's called the cytoplasm. And this includes bacteria, so these are the bugs that can sometimes make you sick. Uh, these are the ones that they can grow very easily on petri dishes. These are the prokaryotic organisms. Now for us paleontologists, the most important prokaryotic is the cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are the blue-green algaes, and they are a photosynthesizing bacteria. Now what's really interesting about cyanobacteria, even though it's a single-celled organism, they often will grow in long chains. They reproduce by asexual reproduction, but each cell basically grows along these strands, but they keep connected. They're not free-floating. So that means that they keep growing in these long strands. They're tiny little strings, and they float around in the water. And as long as they have sunlight, they do very well because they have the mechanism for photosynthesis. There's some evidence to indicate that these cyanobacteria are the first organisms to um, be able to photosynthesize. And actually, most of the photosynthesizing organisms basically are using or hijacking the technology of these early prokaryotic cells. Now, we have fossils of cyanobacteria that go back 3,496 million years ago, some of the earliest life that we have here on the planet. These are found in chert carbonate facies, so mostly often in chert, which is a silica, can actually preserve these very small fibers. Now, these are really, really teeny, and it takes a lot of work to actually um, find these and discover them. They find them in long chains that seem to have indicating that these are cyanobacteria. They look very much like modern cyanobacteria. And there's a variety of different types. There's six different types. Some of them um, have different sizes. Other ones are sort of free-floating uh, in these uh, chert carbonate facies. Now, the other major type of organisms are eukaryotic organisms. And these include all multicellular organisms, including you and I. Eukaryotics are larger cells. They're much more complex. They ca contain a nucleus. They contain organelles, and many of the organelles actually have their own DNA. They have very specialized parts. And our cells are eukaryotic cells, as those of plants and animals and many microorganisms as well. They're single-celled. So eukaryotic cells are much more complicated cells. They include many types of organelles, mitochondria, and um, different types of uh, complexes, so a very complicated cell. Now, one of the theories on the origin of eukaryotes um, comes from the work of Lynn Margellis. Lynn Margellis um, proposed an idea called the endosymbiotic theory for the origin of eukaryotic um, cells. And the idea is this, that basically these early cells, single-celled organisms, begin to um, invaginate or incorporate prokaryotic organisms within themselves. So instead of eating the prokaryotic uh, organism, they would basically just have the prokaryotic organism live with inside of itself. It's a symbiotic relationship, an endosymbiotic relationship. Now, the fossil evidence for the origin of eukaryotic cells is a bit complicated because what you have to find is evidence of a nucleus and organelles within these cells, which is a little tricky to do. Um, one of the ones that's been put forth is uh, Glen Botryodon, which is found in these chert carbonate um, deposits. And these are cells that have like what looks like little spots inside them. And these spots have been proposed as being um, a nucleus. However, a lot of people have argued, and probably rightly so, that this actually might be the shrinkage of the contents of the cell. So these are just basically kind of a little bit carbon film of the contents of the cell and probably are not necessarily a nucleus. So there's a lot of debate of when we start to see eukaryotic organisms. Now, during the Proterozoic, during the Precambrian, we have actually a lot of fossils, and most of those fossils are stromatolites. So stromatolites are these weird accretionary structures. They're thinly layered. They're megascopic, which means you can, you can observe them without a microscope. They're calcareous, so they are producing um, uh, calcareous skeletons that basically adhere to each other. Each other. And stromatolites are interpreted to be produced by mat-building communities of microorganisms. 
These are photoautotrophic, which means these are photosynthesizing organisms, primary producers, and they're prokaryotic organisms. Cyanobacteria is what produce stromatolites. Now, stromatolites have an excellent fossil record going all the way from 3,500 3, million years ago to the present day. This is the famous stromatolites in Shark Bay, Australia. And we can study them. They tend to grow in places where they don't have any herbivores like um, gastropods that would feed on them. So they usually are found in very restricted types of environments that haven't been colonized by organisms that chew and eat up these things. So if there is no herbivores, they grow and they're very plentiful in those areas. And they form these mats and grow over time and they form those little layers that you see in the fossils. So the oldest stromatolites extend back about 3,500 million years ago. Um, but by about 2,750, they become very common. Um, this is a chart from a, a monograph that was published by Scholf in 2006 showing the distribution of these Archean, or these very early stromatolites, that occur before 2,500 million years ago. And you can see that you know early on they're fairly common, but then as we get to 2,500 million years ago, they become very common. And at all of these stromatolites, these um, cyanobacteria living in these algal mats, were um, ex um, expelling or respiring oxygen. So there is a buildup of oxygen in the atmosphere. As we get a little higher, we start to get fossil evidence, uh, definitive fossil evidence of eukaryotic organisms, so more complicated organisms. These are actually found in the shale siltstone facies. And these are bizarre eukaryotic sort of algae things. And these are called acotards. These are organic walls or microplankton. Um, they're interpreted as being related to protus. These are the single-celled eukaryotic organisms that live today. And um, the, some of them uh, might be actually reproductive cysts uh, that exist, but we start to find them. And they're very complicated. There's lots of different types of them. Um, they're difficult to classify with the organisms we have living today, but there's all sorts of different shapes and stuff. Um, and they're found particularly as you get into the Neoproozoic towards the end of the Precambrian. We have pretty good evidence also of eukaryotic life in the form of early algae that appear around 900 million years ago in Siberia. And here we have an example of them. They're much, much larger than cyanobacteria. These are also found in chert. And we have these sort of bigger strands that appear to be sort of early algae, um, eukaryotic algae that we start to see. So um, by about 900 million years ago, we, we have eukaryotic life existing on the planet. So eukaryotics are very common. Their fossil record picks up as we head into the Phanerozoic. And there's different types and groups of eukaryotic or single-celled organisms. These are the protozoans. So we have uh, red algae. These are the, the rhodophylla. These are the um, algae blooms that happen in the ocean that you hear about, the red tides. We have the radiolarians, the dinoflagellates, the foraminifera, the coccolithophora, and the diatoms. We'll talk more about these later on, but these are all microorganisms that leave behind an excellent fossil record, and we have a really good fossil record of each one of these organisms. And they're very useful for micropaleontology. So we can kind of divide up single-celled life into prokaryotics. These are the very teeny organisms, the archaeobacteria and the eubacteria. And then we can divide up the eukaryotes, single-celled organisms, into the protozoans and the true algae, or the protus. All right, let's talk about the major kingdoms. Um, this is the older style of, of dividing up the kingdoms of life. Um, the first is Monteria. Sometimes eubacteria and the archaean are placed in separate kingdoms. Um, this includes all the pro prokaryotic organisms, so a very diverse group of organisms. Second, we have the prototistia. These are the protozoans, the nucleotided algae, the protus, the slime molds. These are all single-celled organisms, very common throughout the world. And then we get into more complicated multicellular organisms. This includes fungi, mushrooms, lichens, stratophytes, or symbionts. We have the plants, placed in their own kingdom. This is all eukaryotic plants that we'll talk about. 
And then we have animals, and this includes sponges and multicellular heterotrophs. These are eating predators, um, herbiv herbivores. They are not autotrophs. And these include all the metazoans uh, of organisms with multicellular uh, cells. So what are metazoans? So these are the first multicellular organisms. And the first ones we begin to see is during the Archean uh, of Australia, which is the very latest part of the Proterozoic, now placed in the Neoproterozoic. Um, so these are very late occurring uh, organisms. And they're found in this fauna in Australia. And they're just completely and totally bizarre. Probably the most famous one that was discovered is Springania. This is a weird sort of tube-like shape organisms. These are all soft body organisms. They don't have skeletons. So the only fossil evidence we have of them are impressions in a sandstone in the Archean uh, of Australia. And um, they've been also found in a few other places as well. And they're bizarre. And people really don't know exactly what they are. This is another one. This is Dickinsonia, um, which people think might be related to annelid worms, like uh, like maybe related to, like, that's the same group that earthworms belong to. These are flat. They're pretty small. Um, just weird little in you know patterns that we see in these sandstones. And they seem to indicate that there was this early life, un unskeletonized life, that we see these very faint impressions in the rocks. Other ones include Cardinia discus. Um, and Cardinia discus is this weird um, one. It appears to have like a stalk um, at the end of it and probably hung up and had this fan that goes up here. And some people have suggested these might be related to um, sea pins. Um, sea pins are a group of cnidarians. So they're a type of coral. They're often classified as a soft coral because they don't create hard parts uh, that live in the oceans today. Um, and so there's some people that support the idea that maybe some of these early Ediacaran uh, fossils are relatives of these cnidarians. There's some other ones that appear to look more like other cnidarians, such as medusoids. These are the um, planktonic cnidarians that include jellyfish living today. So there's some indication of some indentations that might be these medusoid cnidarian organisms in the Ediacaran. So a lot of people are trying to identify these Ediacaran fossils based on what we know today of the diversity of life. And there's another point of view, the Vendonzian hypothesis. This is a hypothesis that was put forward by Alfred Zenglenker in the 1980s. The idea of the Vendozian hypothesis is that these organisms during the Archean are so different that they are their own order, their own group, the Vendozia. And they're not related at all to modern groups. So the idea is then, if the Vendozian hypothesis is that these weird organisms go extinct after the Ediacaran. And as we enter into the Cambrian, we get a new assemblage of organisms. But other people argue that maybe many of these Ediacaran fossils actually extend into the Cambrian, and some of these might be with us today, or at least their descendants with us today. Now, one of the things that happens at the Cambrian boundary is that we get skeletons for the first time. These are small shelly fossils. Uh, and we start to get skeletons. And instantly, the fossil record becomes very populated with organisms. And a large part of that is because of all of these uh, skeletons, these hard parts that preserve well, so we get a good fossil record. So oftentimes this is referred to as the Cambrian explosion because you get all of these organisms that leave behind hard skeletons and we have lots of fossils. Now it's kind of an explosion with a long fuse, but as we come into the Cambrian, the diversity of life becomes very, very abundant and very rich and we start to be able to pick up organisms that we can recognize today, such as trilobites and brachiopods and various corals and, and arthropods. <laughs> All right, so what caused this big, huge explosion of life? 
Well, there's physical chemical factors that could have played a role, such as an oxygen-rich atmosphere that happened for that long period of photosynthesizing life. Another idea that's been put forth is glaciations. This is an idea that is developed out of the snowball earth hypothesis that Paul Hoffman and others have been arguing for. And that is that the, the world went through these, these huge glaciations in which it nearly froze completely, or maybe the oceans did freeze completely. And that caused organisms, multicellular organisms, to be have to protect themselves or be in very small populations that are in the periphery, and so cause some fast evolution to occur. Um, also, the release of phosphorus from the seafloor after those events, too, so nutrient blooms. Um, and a global recession where basically sea levels um, fell, and that caused a lot of these organisms to have very restricted geographic locations that they lived in. There's also biological factors that played probably influence in the Cambrian explosion of diversity. The first is predation. Uh, this increases selection pressure, so if you have to worry about somebody eating you, uh, all of a sudden it's going to cause evolution to work and natural selection to work much faster than if you're living in a world of just autotrophs. And so as soon as you had predation, it's going to cause selective pressures to try to build a skeleton to protect you from getting eaten. So skeletons are also very important. They're innovation for muscle attachments, mouth parts, and guts, and they also provide protection. And so this might be one of the reasons why we see so much life at the beginning of the Cambrian. So one of the interesting things that's been really put forth is this idea of glaciation being a very important factor. Just prior to the Ediacaran is a major global glaciation event called the Marathonian glaciation. And this um, may have caused an explosion of some of these multicellular organisms. And then as we enter into the Ediacaran, there is a second glaciation event that may have resulted in many of these skeletonized organisms appearing in the fossil record. So throughout the Neoproizoic, as we go into the Cambrian, these major glaciation events that happened at 710, 635, and 582 million years ago may have been important or needed for these organisms to find very restricted areas and you'd have very small population sizes and this would result in rapid changes in the origin of multicellular organisms um, and proliferation diversity. And then after the glaciation appear, um, occurred, they group together again in the now free oceans and you have evolution occurring as they come in contact with each other. So this is a very interesting new idea that's been put forth um, for the origin of multicellular organism and where these major glaciation events or global snowball earth ideas um, might have played a role in the origin of these U, um, diversity of life, of multicellular life in the resulting Cambrian after these events. So now let's talk about the ways in which we divide up metazonians. So there's different ways in which we do it and it's based on the body plan. So the simplest metazoans are organisms that have two layers. They have an ectoderm on the outside and an endoderm on the inside. And these include things like jellyfish, the cnidarians. So cnidarians are diploblastic. How jellyfish eat is basically they just sort of wrap their endoderm, the inner layer, around their prey, and then they just secrete their cells and cause the, cell, the, the nutrients to go into the cells. So they trap an organism against them and then those endoderm cells basically eat them. In fact, it's kind of like eating something without having a stomach or, or a digestive gut tube. Um, and the cnidarians do quite well. These are all the corals as well, um, so a very large group. The next group is the triploblastic acelomates, and these include the flatworms. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a really good fossil record of flatworms, but based on their very primitive way in which they class or divide up their cells, um, they are sort of a step above the cnidarian condition. They add a new layer, and that's the mesoderm. So they have an endoderm, a mesoderm, and an ectoderm. So they have three layers. They don't have necessarily any sort of cecum in the inside, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but in embryology that means that there's no um, inner layer, this is the gut lining that sort of lines your guts, and so this inner layer in which the organs sort of fit into the coelom. 
So the, the last group is the triploblastic coelomates. So coelomates have a gut tube, and they have an ectoderm, an endoderm, and mesoderm, and they also have this coelom that's in there. Now the coelom is really important because if you think about many organisms, including humans, the coelom is this cavity that's inside. And then there's like, um, in humans, there's like a mesentery that goes out from the gut around the endoderm and holds the intestines in place. But this can be found in all sorts of groups. Even the heart is enclosed in this endoderm sort of sac um, inside the animal. This is a way in which we can organize organisms based on their body plan. So there's two major groups of coelomates. Um, the first is the protostoma. These include annelids, mollusks, arthropods. So the way that protostomes form is early on during cell division, they produce the three layers. They have the ectoderm, the endoderm, and then the cecum that starts to develop with the mesoderm. So during cell growth in the early embryo, the cells will start to form like a, a balloon that gets punched in. And that punched in balloon is called the blastopore. Now in protosomes, the blastopore forms the mouth, and there's a separate opening for the anus, for the bottom and the head. Now the other group of coelomates, the duteostromes, when the blastoform forms, that's actually the butt, and the head, or the mouth, forms out of the mesoderm in, this, in the coelom that forms on the other end. So in a sense, this is a very big division that happens very early on in the embryo of different types of protostomes and duteostomes. So this division of the two groups of the solomate um, animals is a big division. So the duteostromes include chordates, including us and all vertebrates, includes echinoderms, and includes the hemichordates. So these are the groups that are duteostomes, whereas the protostomes are the annelids, the mollusks, and the arthropods. So insects, all the insects are part of the protostomes. So a very fundamental difference that we see in the early embryology of these organisms and plays out in the major split between animals. All right, I'm going to quickly go through um, Stabansky's curve here of major extinc extinctions, just to give you a quick overview of the things that happen after the Cambrian and some of the major extinctions. So Stabansky's curve is the number of genera of marine life found in the fossil record, and it's a great curve to look at the major patterns that we see in the history of life. It was first developed in the 1970s and 1980s by going into libraries and reading and trying to put all of these things together, putting in the ranges. Um, it's been tweaked quite a bit. This is the original one they pulled, but it really highlights some of the major extinction events. And there's five major extinction events. The first one is at the end of the Ordovician, that you can see there. The next one after that is one that occurs in the late Devonian. And then there's a ma the biggest ma major extinction is the Permian-Triassic extinction event that's nearly wiped off all of life. Um, pretty, pretty devastating event. Um, really affected the oceans and, and marine organisms. And then we have the end Triassic major extinction event. And then finally, the Cretaceous-Paleocene, or the KT boundary. This is the extinction event that killed off the dinosaurs. Those are the five major mass extinction events. So life has had to struggle along. We'll be talking about different organisms and their different stratigraphic ranges throughout the Phanerozoic, throughout this period of life where we have these major extinction events that occur. So thank you for watching this lecture at Utah State University. If you're interested in taking a class at Utah State University, check out our geology website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in my research and who I am, check out my website at benjaminslashberger.org. Thanks for watching.